Yeah, I, th- I think the situation in the United States is actually even simpler. Uh, and, and that is uh, the Israeli lobby, by the way, which is this strange amalgamation of uh, rich Jews to an important extent and uh, evangelicals uh, who uh, have their own biblical literalism, uh, you know, looking for uh, the uh, Armageddon. Uh, which uh, they think depends on uh, Israel holding uh, these lands, um, is simply very powerful in the U.S. and has been powerful for a long time uh, and uh, has a lot of uh, financial resources. And America, uh, American democracy is, is uh, one dollar, one vote. You know, it's uh, basically a completely corrupt political system based on uh, raising uh, money for uh, expensive campaigns. So the Israeli lobby has long had a uh, high influence. From the point of view of most American Jews, I can tell you from my own experience, and I think it's pretty standard, support for Israel was deeply enculturated, uh, you know, uh, for American Jewry, period. Uh, and again, it was not seen or foreseen uh, that this was a genocidal impulse and it was on overwhelmingly secular ground. So there's very little uh, religious orthodoxy in the Israel lobby at all. You don't even hear about it. My own guess is the following, therefore, it's, you know, again, not an insider's view. First, I don't think most wealthy American uh, leader, political figures or leaders of the Israel lobby. And that's a lot of people on Wall Street, for example, a lot of very big money. Um, I don't think they really understand much at all about this biblical or philosophical or religious nationalist or ideological view. It's more a knee jerk support Israel. Uh, period. Israel's under threat, support it, period. So I, I think that there's very little understanding. Uh, and again, I'm being a little bit introspective because my own understanding uh, um, needed a massive scaling up uh, just to understand what was going on and who are these figures, uh, many of whom I had never heard of before uh, until they became agents of uh, genocide. So this, this is uh, one part. Second, an, a politician like Biden, who's nothing but an old school politician, we have no idea what his real state of mind is, capacity to think or anything else right now, frankly. But his instinct completely is don't show a shade of gap with Israel. Now, by the way, even saying that, it's amazing how... Even Biden has been out there saying this is terrible what's happening and have some more bombs, by the way. Uh, so I don't think it's cynical, actually, although, of course, in outcome, it's profoundly cynical. It's pathetic is what it is. It's pathetic in that Biden, as a person, clearly sees this is horrendous. It's not a fake. Uh, it's not a disguise. But what's pathetic is how weak it is, because the guy, for God's sake, is president of the United States, and he should pick up the phone and say to Netanyahu, you're not getting any more weapons, period. Not with this mass killing. And the United States could shut this down in a day if it chose to. But it doesn't choose to, not because it supports genocide or ethnic cleansing, uh, but because it's so deeply ingrained, don't get ahead of the Israeli lobby bulldozer. It's a bad thing to do. Now, even with all of that, you know, the American Jewish community is at this point pretty much in angst and deeply divided. It's in, in this way, a, a little bit impressive, I would say, although you wouldn't think it's too impressive, but, uh, you know, support for Israel is collapsing among the Jews in America. 
not, not just among American society more generally, what's happening is disgraceful, disgusting, illegal, murderous. There's no other word for it uh, and or words for it. Uh, and so this is actually permeating a lot of American society. But the political class doesn't live on public opinion. It lives on campaign contributions. And so one big billionaire campaign contributor outweighs a hell of a lot of percentage points of American public opinion till now. I'm not giving up. I'm speaking out because I want the United States to stop arming Israel, period. And not in weeks or months, today, this hour, this moment. And I'm making the point every day because I live in the UN context. We're the last bulwark for a genocide right now. No one else supports this in the whole world. By the way, no one else practically could support it. Some European countries like Germany are afraid to speak out for their own historical and political reasons. But it's only the United States practically that enables this to go on hour by hour. And so I'm trying to make the case in the U.S. We're completely isolated. It's completely horrible. It is not complicated. It is not complicated. It's not, oh, my God, what are we going to do about Hamas and so forth? There are other ways to security than killing tens of thousands of people and starving hundreds of thousands of people. There is such a thing called diplomacy. And this is conveniently or inconveniently or obnoxiously forgotten by the United States because they're not trying diplomacy. But this is the, the, the real answer. No, I, I agree with you. And I think um, I think the, the, what you're saying is really very profound. I think for the vast majority of Americans, and I've lived in America, and uh, the idea of Israel is just this romantic thing from Hollywood. I call it Harvey Weinstein Zionism, essentially, where you just get your ideas from all of these amazing Hollywood films where Israel is the underdog that's out there making the deserts bloom and being fought by all these irrational, crazy people who just hate them for the sake of hating them. It's a good point, by the way. You know, the bestseller movie was Exodus, mm -hmm. not Nakba. So, exactly. <laughs> you know, if there, if, if there was Nakba, there would also be understanding uh, of, uh, you know, what this is uh, all about. Yeah. So you could really have a human solution. But uh, it, it is a set of uh, images and not a deep understanding, which is a big problem. And it's it continues to become more and more separated from the reality on the ground because, as you said, today's Israel is being controlled. I mean, the most important influential ministers are the two you mentioned, uh, Smotrich and Ben Gvir. And I think, I mean, you don't have anybody that can be in any way comparable within American politics. It's, it's completely un unimaginable for anyone to come up in the U.S. and say, we should do to blacks in the U.S. What? Imagine if just someone said exactly the same thing this much just says. I mean, Ben Gvir said the... Uh, look, the, 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 the need for my family to be able to drive around the streets of the West Bank is more important than anything for the Palestinians. Smotrich said, Palestinians have three options. They can leave, they can die, or they can live subjugated to Israelis. I mean, just imagine somebody... And by the way, and by the way he put out a plan. It, it's not just a slogan. Yeah. He actually put out a plan. So you it's have very elaborate. A, a major Israeli minister with an elaborate plan of ethnic cleansing or murder or or uh, uh, or, or, or or departure. Uh, it's 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 unbelievable. It is unbelievable. But of and course, think, you know, people need to read that. They don't read that. They don't know. Uh, and uh, again, even these, you know, the Israel lobby isn't exactly going its out of its way to give us a reading list. And so you have to search this stuff out. Yeah, absolutely. And the more time goes on, I think what's happening is just this cognitive dissonance that six months of just mass slaughter. I mean, people are, I mean, conditioning and propaganda is very uh, difficult to break, but I think a lot of people are beginning to just ask questions now because this doesn't sound like they're just out there to fight terrorism and get the hostages. I mean, there are 
certainly easier ways. It's, it seems very clear, as many of the hostages' families are saying, it's very clear that the last thing what Netanyahu wants at this point is a deal that frees the hostages. Because the real goal for him and for his coalition, it's a golden opportunity to use the hostages as an excuse to destroy all of Gaza, to use Hamas's intransigence and Hamas's fanaticism as an excuse to just destroy all Gaza, make it uninhabitable, and get hopefully a couple of million people to leave. That, that, uh, that's what Smotrich said. I think that's right. And if it isn't right, it would take five minutes for Netanyahu to make clear that it isn't right. Because all Netanyahu would have to say is, uh, and you may then agree or not agree or whatever, but he would have to say, our enemy is Hamas, but we agree uh, that there will be a Palestinian state, have no doubt about that. Of course, he's never going to say that. Uh, This is antithetical. But if he did mean that this is about Hamas, then there's a, a way to say that and not lose the other 191 UN member states, uh, putting uh, the United States uh, in this uh, limbo position as the 192nd, because there are 193 UN member states in all, and uh, none support uh, Israel to be the greater Israel, which is uh, what Smotrich and Ben Gavir certainly want, and what I think, I mean, certainly what Netanyahu wants as well. So if it were really about security, Israel could say so in a way that is, at least from that point of view, clear. But the fact that Netanyahu, at a minimum, prevaricates about the post-war situation in Gaza really means, of course, that the goal is not defeat Hamas. The goal is greater Israel. And there's not the slightest attempt to uh, dissuade uh, anybody from that supposition, which he could easily do. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to also ask you, you, you're uh, in touch with RFK Jr. and you're working as an economic advisor, I believe, to his campaign? Or Well, I, I'm, I'm a friend. We're classmates. Uh, I like him, but he does not have an acceptable position on this issue. Uh, and uh, I'm not endorsing him uh, under these circumstances because this is, to my mind, both in and of itself extremely important. And as I've said to him, it's it's also a test. If you don't recognize this as a genocide, <laughs> what do you do? And so I'm trying my best to explain my point of view to him let me just say almost all the time. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, and so far, uh, not clearly uh, to any success. Yeah, I think it's, it's massively disappointing because, I mean, he was uh, one of the first candidates in a very long time in the U.S. that seems to be offering something different. When he talks about foreign policy, when he talks about all kinds of issues, he's even yeah. in monetary policy, he's open to Bitcoin and so on. Yeah. And then I, I like Bobby a lot, and we've been friends for we were in school together more than 50 years ago uh, to show my age, but also to just point out we've known each other for a very long time. I like him enormously, but I cannot support a candidate that cannot get this right. I can't. Yeah. And of course, your hero is his uncle, JFK, and you've written a book about his uncle and his um, uh, quest. And what, what, are, what are your thoughts on the difference between the two of them? And how do you think JFK would have handled this? Well, I tell Bobby all the time, be like your dad and your uncle, because they were both heroes for me. Uh, And I believe, actually, I'm friends with a lot of the Kennedys, and I love the Kennedy family. uh, And uh, and I love what uh, Jack, President John F. Kennedy and and Robert Kennedy stood for. And Robert Kennedy was my my first political love, because uh, John F. Kennedy, I was too young. uh, But Robert Kennedy, I was... uh, um, 13 uh, when he was assassinated and he was my candidate. And, uh, uh, you know, that stays with you your whole life. Um, So what John F. Kennedy uh, believed in and learned, especially uh, almost the hard way, but uh, learned 
in his brief presidency was uh, to negotiate uh, and to try to find uh, peaceful solutions. And he came into the presidency in 1961 <clears throat> saying in his inaugural address, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. He believed in talking. Uh, the next two years was very complicated uh, and not very successful uh, because the CIA put a plan on his desk to uh, invade Cuba and uh, Kennedy went along with it <clears throat> to his counter to his instincts, but he did go along with it. And that was the Bay of Pigs and it was a disaster. And it led Khrushchev to put in nuclear weapons into Cuba afterwards. And that brought us to the brink of nuclear annihilation in October 1962. And Kennedy uh, was surrounded by advisors who said, take them out, military invade Cuba, which would have likely led to uh, nuclear annihilation. Uh, but Kennedy had the instinct, we can find a peaceful way out of this. And in a very complicated maneuver, when there was not a Zoom, not direct communication of, uh, of uh, global leaders, back channels, teletypes, slow communication, miscommunication, misunderstanding, he worked out a peaceful settlement uh, with Khrushchev. And in the following year, he did what I regard as one of the greatest acts of statesmanship of modern history, why I wrote a, a book called uh, uh, To Move the World, JFK's Quest for Peace. He negotiated a, a peace treaty, in essence, with the Soviet Union in the form of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And what's amazing about it is, and hard for you know uh, people to understand, negotiating with the Soviet Union in 1963 would be like Biden. I mean, it's possible, but Biden... It's never going to do it would be like Biden standing up and say, I want to make peace with Iran or I want to make peace with China. Of course, he should do that. And Kennedy had the guts to do it and succeeded and made a great treaty. But it took tremendous guts. And he made a great speech on peace in June 1963 uh, that I absolutely adore. I think it's the greatest speech by uh a president in modern history, one of the greatest ever. Um, and uh, I, that's what I wrote my book about, this peace campaign. And many people think, and I think it's absolutely plausible, that Kennedy was killed for his peace initiative in the same way that Yitzhak Rabin was killed for calling for peace, uh, in the same way that Martin Luther King was killed for uh, calling for racial justice, in the same way that Robert Kennedy was killed trying to uh, get America out of the Vietnam War. I mean, we have a very dark side, and 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 there's a, not a small chance that this was a coup uh, in 1963 with the active CIA participation, at the least, that took Kennedy out. But to come back to your question, uh, these were acts of incredible human insight uh, of uh, John F. Kennedy to save the world uh, and then to move the world towards peace required a, well, it required a great decency and humanity. Uh, and uh, decency and humanity can actually get you a long way. The first thing you do is you stop dehumanizing or vilifying the other and you start understanding that they are human beings, they have a history, they have reasons. And in the case of Palestine, plenty of excellent reasons uh, to want something different from what there is right now. And with some basic humanity, we could sort this out peacefully, not with slaughter or ethnic cleansing or genocide, but peacefully. Of course, we have a president who is, I think, almost surely physically incapable of doing this, uh, but also uh, by... Uh, dint of his whole political career, uh, intellectually and emotionally uh, incapable of doing this as well. Biden has never been a peacemaker. Biden has always been an agent of the military industrial complex. He's always been for NATO enlargement. He's always been for dirty tricks. He played a role in the overthrow of the Ukraine government in 2014. So 
I don't think he knows how to do this anyway, which is really terrible at this moment. And it doesn't look like any of the three main options for the next presidential election is going to be any different. I mean, uh, Trump seems to be um, similar in the sense of just being full on, uh, let give Israel everything they want. If he's critical of Biden, it's that he's not giving them enough. And JFK seems to be the same thing. I mean, it's 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 amazing uh, watching him just uh, turn into um, uh, you know evangelical Christian Zionist. <laughs> Yeah, the sad part about Bobby is that uh, I think he'd actually win the presidency if he had the right platform, because everyone is so disgusted with Trump and Biden. Uh, I think Bobby could actually do it. Uh, And so even on purely pragmatic grounds, I wish he would do it. But of course, I want him to do it on deeper grounds, and I want him to do it on Kennedy grounds, which is make peace. It's possible. Don't dehumanize the other side. I keep telling him also, stop inflating Hamas as if it's this unbelievable, unbelievable monster that must be controlled and nothing can happen uh, without addressing that. There are nations, there are other countries, there's diplomacy, there there are ways to find peace. Uh, And and so I'm hoping still somehow that uh, he'll come to that, but it better be quick. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's a lost campaign anyway. And what are your thoughts on what's happening in Ukraine? I know you've been very outspoken about this, and uh, you have very strong opinions about U.S. policy there. What are your thoughts on how that is going and where it is going? Well, it's basically the same thing. It's a, it's a war that absolutely, unequivocally could have been avoided at repeated periods of time many of which I know well because I was an advisor to Gorbachev and to Yeltsin and to Kuchma, the second president of independent Ukraine. I know this region well. And basically, uh, Ukraine should have done what it said it was going to do when it declared independence, and that's remain neutral. And that's what the people of Ukraine wanted. They know that they're a bridge between you. Western Europe and Russia. Uh, and uh, as a bridge, be neutral on both sides. And they knew that, by the way, by overwhelming majorities. But the U.S. Uh, military industrial complex could not stand that. By the way, if there's one thing that uh, the uh, American deep state hates, it is neutrality. It's not enemies. They love enemies. <laughs> enemies uh, get you get you arms sales. They get you wars. They get you uh, able to practice uh, your military. But they hate neutrals. And the U.S. has a whole history of killing and overthrowing neutral leaders. By the way, it's stunning. If and it's the old slogan: If you're not with us, you're against us. And they really believe that because the statement is almost like a joke like a caricature, you know, that uh, Darth Vader would say in in the Star Wars. But no, that's actually the American position. If you're not with us, you're against us. So they hate neutral leaders. And Ukraine won. The, the people understood this. They're so much uh, Russian and ethnic culture and uh, shared uh, orthodoxy and faith and many other things. And so they wanted neutrality. They did not want NATO. And yet we had our neocons Newland, who's about to become my colleague at Columbia. Oh, my God. Congratulations. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> It'll be Hil- Hillary and uh, Victoria. Yes, we said Ukraine has to become part of NATO. And that was a campaign that started in the late 1990s. Biden was absolutely on side on this. Victoria Newland was first Cheney's advisor then Bush's ambassador to NATO when they push for NATO enlargement, then Hillary's spokesperson, and then the assistant secretary of state for European affairs in 2014, when the U.S. actively participated in the overthrow of a neutral government and installed a government that said, we want NATO. So the war was provoked by NATO enlargement to this crazy degree, and by the way, completely against uh, all the promises uh, that had been made uh, by uh, George uh, 
Herbert Walker Bush Sr. Uh, and James Baker III and others to Gorbachev back in 1990 that NATO wouldn't move one inch eastward. Anyway, it kept moving, kept moving, kept moving, and then it was supposed to move to Ukraine and even to the country of Georgia on the uh, eastern uh, coast of the Black Sea, which definitely is not a North Atlantic country, <laughs> if one knows a little bit of geography. But it's this insanity of endless NATO enlargement. Well, su suffice it to say, there were numerous exit ramps, and the United States refused all of them. And even after the special military operation started on February 24th, 2022, there was an immediate exit ramp, and that was the direct negotiations between Russia and Ukraine calling for Ukrainian neutrality and agreeing on it in talks mediated by Turkey in Ankara. And they were close to an agreement and the United States said, no, fight on, fight on. We don't accept neutrality, fight on. And here we are till today. And Biden absolutely does not talk to Putin. All he does is insult a, a, a counterpart uh, who happens also to have 6,000 nuclear warheads uh, and is uh, beating to a pulp Ukrainians and Biden's, uh, you know, clever ideas to call Putin a, a crazy SOB. You just cannot make this up. How immature, how puerile, how uh, ineffective, how destructive uh, the U.S. foreign policy is. It's just unbelievable. Any chance for peace, yeah. they reject because they don't believe in diplomacy. For me, I think what is the most unconscionable thing about it is when American politicians say, look, we're fighting Putin and it's not even costing us any uh, lives from our military. And it's just, for me, it's so callous and criminal to just, yeah, well, we're, we're burning all these young Ukrainian boys and men, uh, go, sending them to their graves. It's not quite Smotrich and Ben Gavir, but it's, it's in the same ilk. You know, they literally say it's not American lives being lost. Richard Blumenthal, senator of Connecticut, explicitly on this greatest bargain that money can buy. Uh, Lindsey Graham. Uh, yeah. I can't even say on public company my true view of him. Mitt Romney. They're all like this. Uh, and so it is a kind of vulgarity. Say, if we're going to have to wrap up, uh, I'm afraid it's uh, incredible to speak with Likewise, you. we should have uh, finished up uh, how Bitcoin fixes this. Ten years ago, I gave a presentation at Columbia and spoke to Bitcoin. You were a bit skeptical, but a couple of years later, you emailed me saying, okay, there's something there. So I just want to get a quick yeah. uh, reaction from you. What are your thoughts on Bitcoin? And let me just tell you why I think it fixes it. If the U.S. government can't print money, 90% of all of these problems are thrown out the door. You, you just can't hand over tens of billions of dollars to military contractors to keep promoting more and more wars. People are going to have to find a way to talk and reduce those conflicts. It's not going to end conflict, but I think conflict will be a lot less bloody. Well, let's just say I agree completely that we need to find ways to talk uh, and uh, we need to discuss Bitcoin because there's uh, uh, it's it's been an amazing ride. Uh, you know, I'm I'm still, uh, I know it's uh, completely contrary to uh, probably almost every listener, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm still worried about completely uh, unmonitored uh, transactions, you know, for good or for bad, uh, because I kind of believe uh, in the rule of law. Uh, admittedly, I, my belief is predicated on the idea that governments uh, can be made to do the right thing. So I admit our whole conversation proves me wrong on that. <laughs> uh, and, and so I don't want to take an overly uh, stark view of this. I'm not uh, by instinct a libertarian because I believe there is such thing as the common good. And I believe uh, I'm a, basically an Aristotelian in my philosophy. I believe that uh, there can be government for the good, but uh, I know uh, that will run against the grain. And I have to say, I didn't give a single shred of evidence in favor of my views over the last hour of discussion. So I don't want to. I don't want to hold them uh, too true and fast. I want to. <laughs> Keep them open as provisional. So 